Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part two of CT of the spleen, one of your favorite organs, no doubt. And let's start with looking at some of the common benign splenic tumors. I mentioned that in general, most lesions in the spleen, if you do not have a known malignancy, are going to be benign. We think of three, splenic cysts, hemangiomas, and hematomas. Splenic cysts are like almost any organ that has cysts, right? Well-defined water density, sharply marginated. At times, particularly epidermoid cysts can get so large they need to be resected, partly because people worry about them rupturing, which is pretty rare. But more just on sheer size, they have mass effect, can push on the stomach or diaphragm, and can cause discomfort for patients. You can see a very nice example in this case of a splenic cyst, about seven or eight centimeters pushing on the stomach. It can also push on the kidney. And in this case, the diaphragm is not elevated, but you can imagine why the diaphragm might become elevated. I'm showing you a few very nice looks at the cyst. Now, most of the cysts we see are solitary, particularly the larger ones, but you can have multiple cysts. So here's a good example of multiple splenic cysts. In terms of distinguishing cysts from abscesses, again, water density, sharply marginated, no perfusion changes, no nodularity. Here's a couple more images of that, and here's a few more images as well. It's interesting, if you ask me what the differential of multiple splenic lesions is, probably cysts at the top of the list, but then hemangiomas, hematomas, lymphoma, METs, abscesses, and infarcts. So basically, anything and everything can be multiple, but cysts are the most common. When we talk about cystic splenic lesions, beyond the simple cysts and epidermoid cysts, you can see sequela of a prior hematoma due to trauma. You could think of a cystic change from an infarct. Abscesses can be cystic, but they will have uh, irregular walls or thickened nodularity or perfusion changes near them. Lymphoma and METs can be cystic, but again, it's not going to be that pure cyst appearance. In terms of splenomegaly, I showed you the case before with multiple cysts. So benign and malignant lesions can give you splenomegaly. It can also be due to congestion, like in cirrhosis or failure or sequestration. Obviously, neoplasm, abscesses, some of the collagen vascular diseases, as well as sarcoidosis. Now, one thing to also remember is we can see pseudocysts in the spleen, and it's most commonly a sequela of prior pancreatitis. Remember that at the splenic hilum where the splenic artery and vein enter, it's considered a bare area. If you have pseudocysts and inflammation, fluid could track through that bare area and then cause compressive changes on the spleen. And you can see it very nicely here and here as well. And you can see these can be very large. One of the issues in patients who are alcoholics who develop these pseudocysts beneath the splenic capsule is they can erode the spleen and bleed, or they can make the spleen more susceptible to rupture, even with minor trauma. And just a very nice sort of lenticular appearance, that subcapsular appearance of the patient's so fluid collection, also well seen on 3D. Now we can see cystic lesions with calcification, that's fairly uncommon. I like this example of a dense cyst, and that's often in patients who've had prior uh, trauma with hematomas. Now, splenic hemangiomas are an interesting lesion. We think about hemangiomas in the liver, you talk about 90% are classic. Peripheral puddling, central filling in, maybe a central scar. Hemangiomas in the spleen can enhance very similar to hepatic hemangiomas. That's uncommon. Others may remain hypodense or hypodense, occasionally may have punctate calcifications, and compare, can appear as solid or cystic. We mentioned before that the most common benign tumor in the spleen is going to be a hemangioma. They can be single or multiple. Multiple is often associated with syndromes like klippel trenani weber They may enhance similar to a hepatic hemangioma, but again, that really is not the typical appearance. That's the ones you like to show in conference, but it is fairly uncommon. A couple examples. Here's a very nice set of hemangiomas, peripheral enhancement. And you can see they're gone by the venous phase or essentially gone. Another example here, a dominant hemangioma, which then over time will fill in very nicely. Or in this example, again, this prominent enhancement
in the splenic lesion, which filled in over time. When you think about splenic hemangiomas, this round circular lesion has a very good appearance. It's kind of that donut we also talk about in hepatic hemangiomas. And you can see it here again on these views. Again, it's important to recognize that not every hemangioma has peripheral puddling. It's the minority. And not everyone has enhancement. And so here's a splenic lesion. Low density, well-defined within the spleen on the non-contrast. And here it is in arterial phase imaging. You could see some structure to the internal components of the lesion, and it's somewhat lobulated, but this is very good for hemangioma. Here it is in the coronal view, and there again on the coronal view. Another example, very similar. S low density cystic septations. That's a large splenic hemangioma, which over time doesn't quite fill in, but you can see the margins are sharper. And here's a very nice look at it with cinematic rendering where you can appreciate the textural change, the cystic nature of the lesion, the septations on both the axial and coronal 3D cinematic display. We talk about hemangios being low density, and here's an example of multiple hemangiomas. This one also has a punctate calcification within it. And again, multiple small lesions on the coronal view like this. I guess theoretically in the right scenario, it could be abscesses, but then they're usually symmetric in size. It's not gonna be a malignancy. It's not metastatic disease. So a really good thought would be hemangiomas. And here's another example of hemangioma. Very nice, bright appearance, filling in, puddling. You can see how it washes out on the later phase. And here is a very nice example of that early phase on both the um, coronal view as well as on the cinematic view. And here it is with the feeding vessel going into it. So it really is a mass. It's a definable mass, but it has that characteristic appearance. I mentioned before that things like Klippel Trinani Weber, as in this case, can have multiple hemangiomas. And that's the story here, as well as here and here. The patient uh, gets cystic changes in the lung, which you see here very nicely, and a spontaneous pneumothorax. You also can see splenic hemangiomas, another example of Klippel Trinani Weber, where they replace a significant portion of the splenic gland. Very minimal normal tissue is seen in this case, and here it is on the coronal view. Now, the last thing I'll mention for benign tumors was hamartomas. Hamartomas are rare, but they occur at any age, but more commonly middle-aged females. They're usually solitary, can be associated with tuberous sclerosis. The CT appearance is kind of unique. They're iso or hypodense, but they do show enhancement, though it's slow on the IV early images. It can look similar to hemangiomas, but there are two things about it. One, it's much better defined than hemangiomas, and two, the lesions project exosplenic. They sort of hang off the spleen. Here's a nice example of non-contrast. It's a touch hard to see, pushing on the stomach, but you see how well-defined it is when you give IV contrast? Or here, another example. Here you can see the spleen is not very large, but this is a large lesion. It's just exophytic. It's enhancing. Here it is with a feeding vessel from the splenic artery, but again, notice the enhancement and the fact the lesion is isodense when you get down to the patient's venous phase imaging. So these exophytic lesions, round and lobular, are very good for that classic appearance. Okay, so those are benign lesions. So I think I've given you some good pearls how to diagnose hamartoma, but what about malignancy? Well, if you look for malignancy, then you're typically gonna be talking about metastasis, though there are primary tumors like angiosarcoma and lymphoma. When we look, for example, at this case, vascular lesion in the spleen, ascites, this is more than just that simple hemangioma I showed you before. These lesions are irregular, they're very bright, there's a enlarged spleen present. This is a very good appearance for an angiosarcoma of the spleen. Now, when we talk about splenic tumors, we talk more about metastasis, but primary tumors like an angiosarcoma do occur. When you talk about splenic metastasis, melanoma, ovarian cancer, and pancreatic cancer top the list. 
We talk about hematogenous spread, direct extension, which is more common for pancreas, kidney, and colon. So here's a good example of ovarian cancer, widespread ascites, implants on and in the spleen, and on and in the patient's liver. You can see the implants in the left upper quadrant, very much classic ovarian cancer. Here's another example of ovarian cancer, where you can see the mass on the surface of the spleen growing directly into the spleen, and you can see it here as well, very nicely shown. Here's an example of a splenic lesion, but this patient had renal cell, and it's vascular and metastatic renal cell carcinoma, particularly clear cell type, has vascular mets, and that can occur, though, uncommonly in the spleen, as shown very nicely in this example. And here it is again, and you can see how quickly these lesions will become isodense. We have neuroendocrine tumor metastatic to the spleen from any site. You can see here this large mass, basically exophytic. You also can see implants in the right lower lung, very nicely seen. We talk about splenic involvement by adjacent tumors, and then you think about the thing. Spleen comes and touches the stomach and pancreas, so that's where we're going to get involvement. Also the kidney, also sarcomas in the retroperitoneum. Now this is a good example of a large pancreatic tumor which directly invades the spleen. Now this patient has vascular involvement and liver involvement, so it's not going to be resectable. Splenic involvement by pancreatic cancer does not mean you're not resectable. You'll get a distal pancreatectomy and splenectomy. But of course, once you have diaphragmatic involvement and vascular involvement, that's not going to be the case. And so with this example, you very nicely see the extent of the patient's tumor, the involvement of the spleen, or in this case with gastric cancer, local recurrence, direct extension to involve the spleen and the colon as well. Very, very nicely shown in that example. We can see the infiltration around the splenic hilum, but the infiltration into the spleen proper by direct tumor extension. When we talk about infiltration, we could talk about neoplastic disease like a CLL or lymphoma, inflammatory diseases, and potentially other pathologies. Great example of CLL, very large spleen pushing on the stomach. You notice a salt and pepper appearance to the spleen. You can see it on the venous rather than arterial phase. That salt and pepper appearance is particularly impressive on these images and a very large spleen, beautiful diagnosis of CLL. Now, when we talk about splenic lymphoma, most of the time we have splenic involvement as part of multi-organ system involvement, but you can get primary splenic lymphoma but that's about 1% to 2% of cases, and it's usually non-Hodgkin's B-cell. One of the challenges with lymphoma, when it's primary in the spleen, is that both symptomatically and imaging, it can look like splenic abscesses, so it can be a challenge. And you can see this is a good example of multiple splenic lesions, which easily with the right history could be splenic abscesses, but this was primary lymphoma. Another example, primary lymphoma with multiple masses, multiple nodules, cystic with mural nodules present, but no extension beyond the spleen. Adrenals and kidneys and liver look good. Another example of that case. And then in this example, we see involvement of the spleen, but as we look closer, we'll see multi-organ involvement. So this patient, which has really impressive splenic involvement, also has tumor involving the head of the pancreas. Just a beautiful example of those findings or this case where there's involvement of the spleen and liver and large axillary nodes, which was the reason the patient presented with arm pain. But you can see the splenic lesions very nicely shown. And in this patient, even the accessory spleen sitting in the hilum of the liver had tumor involvement. So just a very nice example showing you the extent of involvement. Now we talk about B-cell lymphoma and that can involve the spleen alone or as a part of a multi-organ system involvement. Beautiful example here and here nicely on the 3D images. Or this example with splenic lymphoma extensive directly involving the spleen to pancreas, adenopathy in the periodic region. Or this example with, again, multiple periodic nodes with lymphoma when it's systemic, large nodes are common, 
and splenic involvement is high percent, maybe 80 to 90 percent. But just a beautiful example of primary uh, splenic involvement, the extensive disease by tail of pancreas, and really the extension out and down into the mesentery. And that's seen very nicely on the coronal display. The coronal display also shows you the extra pancreatic disease with aortic caval nodes and periodic nodes, very nicely seen on both 2D and 3D images. And we've been looking at trying to define this better with cinematic. And you can see very nicely the cinematic infiltration of the patient's spleen. Just a very, very nice example of those findings. Now, one of the complications of large spleen is spontaneous bleed without trauma. Good example here, large spleen CLL, flank pain, positive bleed sign. You can see the blush. So this patient is active bleeding into the spleen. That's the cause of the patient's symptoms. This patient may end up with a splenectomy, but you can see the subcapsular collection. You can see the active extravasation, all very nicely shown on the 3D mapping. And you can see the area of extravasation, the blood on this cinematic very, very well. Now, if I ask the processes that involve the spleen, there are a number of things you can say, and hopefully you'll say them correctly. But let's do this. Let's take a five-minute break, and let's come back, and then we'll finish up. See you then.